Hello, Peter. Nice to see you again. Sorry, I'm slightly late. I was um, stuck on uh, stuck on another call. I couldn't end quickly enough no, no. To, to get in here. No, no, no it's great fun. that you're here now. We're just yeah. about to start. Ladies and gentlemen, we're Shop Until You Drop, Retail Therapy or Mindless Hoarding. And your chair for today is my friend, Detective Chief Superintendent Ben Hargreaves. Ben, we are in your excellent hands. Thank you very much, Ian, and, and welcome everybody. So Ian has introduced the topic for us. Uh, what I'll do is, is just give, give a couple of thoughts, introduce the panel, uh, and then get the panel to give their own take on the subject. Uh, and then we'll throw it open to some wider questions uh, we can, where we can really get this debate going. So what I always like to do with, uh, with these topics is, is always focus on the first thing that enters my mind when I read it. And reading about uh, shopping and consumerism always takes me to the recycling centre. <laughs> and it always fills me with shame that everything that I end up taking there, and I'm sure many of you are the same, we've all had to buy and desperately needed at the time we bought it, but a lot of it does end up on the tip. I'm also very mindful of Dr Attenborough's uh, address to the Security Council this week, uh, again talking about uh, the balance of the earth being in our hands and the impact of consumerism on climate. And just as one final thought, um, I was drawn to the Lily Allen lyric. I am a weapon of massive consumption. It's not my fault, it's how I'm programmed to function. So on that note, I will introduce our panel. So firstly, if I can come to uh, Ruth Wells. Hello. Um, so I'm Ruth, I'm the senior chaplain for Bournemouth University and for the Arts University Bournemouth and I'm an ordained priest in the Church of England. Um, do you want me to give my thought now Ben? Is that the kind yeah, of... Yeah, that would flow nicely wouldn't it? I think, yeah, thank you. Yeah, okay. So um, I'm not very good at the kind of objective ethics. Um, I'm kind of, I embrace the subjective and the emotive. So I love that you use the Lily Allen lyric that kind of pushes all my buttons. Um, and I'm a poet. So I thought my kind of take on things was to write a piece of poetry, which kind of sheds light on my thoughts. So this is what I've written as my kind of introduction. And it's based on the fact that I dreamt that I went to TK Maxx the other day. So uh, last night I dreamt I went to TK Maxx again. There was an illicit allure in the visit, browsing the shelves, touching the stock. I miss shopping. Now I browse screenshots, screenshot items I want to buy, put them by in my basket, or maybe, uh, maybe not return to them later. I admit I hit the buy with one click Amazon button way too often, and I'm trying to balance the ethics around paying tax and paying people a fair wage and making sure they get a break and the safety net of employment benefits with my children's need for school supplies with almost immediate effect, or a winter coat sold at nearly half the price of other retailers. There have been times where we can afford the difference and whether a tax was not the most taxing issue, more how could we afford to pay essential bills this month? Now with the luxury of more disposable income, I've come to question who made this and how where do they live and how much are they paid? If someone makes profit at the cost of their loss, then is my consumption complicit in their abuse? Fast fashion flooded the shop floors of my teenage years and I didn't think much beyond bargain prices. Now the students I work alongside are starting their own slow fashion brands, hands on, handmade, amazing creations. They speak of sustainability, of living wages, of repurposing and refashioning, of upcycling and mend and make do. So I listen to their examples and try to relearn how to buy. I try to examine my reasons for buying, why, I, why TK Maxx still haunts my dreams. <laughs> Is it the instant retail hit of happiness, not easily replicated beyond illegal substances or a lot of endorphin-releasing exercise? 
or the aspiration to be more like someone else, the promise of a better life with a better buy, or the draw of status to passively aggressively assert my social place, an external signal that I'm doing okay, or just a way to escape the boredom, the mundaneness, the monotony of my here and now, who knows? For now, I allow myself a daydream or two about wandering aimlessly around forbidden shops. Ruth, thank you very much for sharing that. That was, um, I think we, we could talk all day about your poem. So um, thank you very much. What a, a, a lovely way to, to start us today. Thank you. Uh, next on my list is uh, Rick Exley. If you'd like to tell us a bit about yourself, Rick, and, and your thoughts. Hello, thank you, Ben. Um, I don't have a poem. I feel really bad now. <laughs> well done, Ruth. That was great. Um, my background, I'm a food and drink consultant. Uh, so all my life, I've spent my working life uh, working for different food and drink companies. So I began my life with Coca-Cola, uh, which I'm sure you've all consumed at some point. Um, then moved on to Glaxo Smith Klein, the pharmaceutical business, looking after Lucasade, Rabina Brands, Horlicks, helping you sleep at night. Um, then a bit of time in Australia working again on more drinks brands. Back to the UK, um, I worked for a brand you've probably never heard of called Global Ethics, and they produce a bottled water called One Water, which is actually the biggest philanthropic water business in the UK and probably soft drinks business, having donated over 20 million pounds to uh, various charities, um, mainly across Africa, putting water into villages across Africa. Um, most recently, um, I guess local to where we are today, uh, Jimmy's Ice Coffee, I ran their business for a few years and now I'm a consultant. So I guess my angle on this is I, my career has been one of those people that push products onto you um, to try and get you to consume more um, from a food and drink perspective, which may not sound as bad as fast fashion, um, but equally, you know, that the industry is geared up to actually encourage you to consume more. Um, everything we do, we promote products in supermarkets, all designed for you to buy more. Um, and the supermarkets themselves and the governments have identified, obviously, there is a massive problem with food waste. So we push it on you. And then sadly, a lot of it ends up in the bin. So there is a problem there. So I guess that's my background. I've worked in food and drink. Um, I guess my take on all of this is it is a challenge. And it's a challenge which... Um, as per David Attenborough, which was referenced earlier, you know, it's one we all have to embrace from the governments all the way down to the consumers. Great. Thanks very much, Rick. Uh, if I come on to Peter, please. Thanks, Ben, very much indeed. Uh, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, nice to see many familiar faces um, having been, joined you during the course of last week. Um, for those of you who um, didn't see last week. I'm Peter Taylor. I'm the managing partner of a law firm in uh, Southampton and Winchester, Paris Smith. Um, I was going to try and embarrass Rick and say that I've actually written a poem as well, but I haven't, so um, he, he's safe. Uh, and I wouldn't want to steal Ruth, Ruth's thunder. A um, number of thoughts go through my mind. Um, one flows from the topic that, uh, the theme that Rick Came, came through with, to what extent are we manipulated by the retailers mm -hmm. and their advertisers and their promotion? And they, you know, Rick, in, in the work that he's done, will have been really successful for his paymasters because he'll been given a task to, to deliver mm -hmm. and, he, and he has delivered it. But are we then the ones who are being manipulated in order to um, want to go off and spend our money in, uh, on those products? The next thought that goes through my mind is really arises during the course of this pandemic. Um, it is amazing how little we actually need in our <laughs> lives. Um, yes, I'm like the rest of you, I guess. I've, I've spent some money on, on Amazon, um, but as a shielded person, I couldn't go out to the shops if I really wanted to. Um, so Father Christmas for me is the Sainsbury's van that comes um, once, a Friday, once a week um, delivering food. Um, but I've been quite happy not actually spending a great deal of money not visiting shops. That then leads on to what is really important in one's life and what does one really remember? Um, 
and I'm sure if we did a straw poll now, people wouldn't remember the things that they bought. They would remember experiences and shared experiences with others. They're far more empowering. And I was messaging someone yesterday and we were we were reflecting on holidays that we've shared with friends and family. So those are far more powerful things than actually retail. And then finally, um, and it comes to the sustainability point, I do remember my my late father when I was very young and we would we lived down on the edge of Dartmoor and we would go out in the car to go for our afternoon um, Sunday walk. And then suddenly one time dad stopped the car. And I said, what do you stop the car for? Oh, he just seen something. And he'd seen some orange string that would tie up a um, bale of hay. I said, what are you going to do with that? He said, I don't know, son. It'll come in useful sometime. <laughs> and that stuck with me as well. But it, so it's how can we repurpose all the stuff that we have got? And I, for one, have got far too much stuff. And I need, I need to thin it out because otherwise I'm going to just be leaving my children with all sorts of problems to um, clear up when, when I've um, passed off this mortal coil. Um, so those are my thoughts. And I hope, and I hope they, they resonate with, with some of you. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Peter. And finally to Marcus. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. It's a real problem on my uh, laptop. Um, hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm Marcus. Um, I'm a police officer currently working at Bournemouth Central. Um, yeah, I'm a bit unusual. I've, I was a late joining to the police um, and I've only been in sort of two and a half years or so. Prior to that, I worked in tertiary education. So I was a, a lecturer and postdoctoral researcher at the University of Bath and the University of Portsmouth, um, where I specialised in the international political economy of development. Um, prior to that, for four years, I worked at the University of Southampton, where I wrote my uh, doctorate, um, which looked at global supply chains and specifically uh, the trade in diamonds internationally. Um, I looked at the international community's efforts to regulate the diamond trade in the wake of the um, conflict diamond controversy of the early noughties. Um, so in some ways today, I'm sort of on reasonably home turf, but it's a really massive subject area. I'm really interested to hear what everyone else thinks on it. Um, I'll give my spiel and I'll try not to ramble on too much because um, it is a subject area that, I, that I'm passionate about. Um, when I looked at the question, there were, there were a couple of things that sprung to mind straight away. It was the term limits on spending and limits on shopping, sorry. Mm. So limits, I mean, I think in the police we have a real habit of doing this when we talk about speed limits. You may, some of you may have heard of police officers talk to you about speed limits at some point in your lives. Um, we allied the word uh, limit with maximum. Um, and that's not always the case, actually. I mean, I know it's, it's sort of common sense in many ways, but limits can be upper and limits can be lower. And I'm going to suggest today that actually we should think about um, putting lower limits on the amount we spend on our shopping. Um, the other thing as well is what do we mean when we say, you know, we should put limits on our spending on shopping? Do we mean um, that we should um, have a minimal maximum spend on our collective shopping, i.e. on our shopping baskets? Or should there be minimum or upper limits on um, how much we spend on individual items? And I think you know, the answers to those questions are complex and they are different depending on what it is you're looking at. Um, so I'll start with the, with the former question first. Should there be limits on, um, on how much we spend on our shopping, um, on our shopping basket, as it were, on all those goods? I would say um, in a, the most abstract and theoretical sense, no, there probably shouldn't be. Um, and I'll demonstrate it. When, when, I was, when I was teaching, I used to have a really smug question I used to enjoy asking my students. It went something along the lines of how many people did you think it was it took to make my coffee? And most people would say sort of, you know, 10, 20 or whatever. Um, and I would very sm smugly reply that actually it was probably in the millions. There are probably millions of people that come together to make your coffee. It's mm. not just the barista. It's not just the, um, the person who drove the lorry or whatever to deliver the beans or even the producer of the beans. It's all those people in between. It's the people who maintain the trucks, people who built the, the coffee machine in the first place, the people who built the sacks that took the beans from the farm to the port in West Africa or whatever. There are literally millions of people involved in all of this. And liberal theorists like to point out that in the process of all of that, everyone is mingling together. 
everyone talks to each other and everyone gets to know each other in that process. And the result of that is that they tend to fear each other less and they tend to fight each other less. And so there is there's a lot of debate about it, but it is there is some definitely some truth in it that countries that trade with each other more and that also are democratic tend to go to war with each other far less. So there's an obvious benefit there to us shopping, to us stimulating that process. And the other thing is slightly more obvious, which is that in the process of buying stuff, in the process of me buying my coffee this morning, we have all of those people at some point will have to have a contribution made towards their living, um, towards their jobs. And this obviously is a good thing because it's ultimately, if we believe in capitalism as the mode of production, then it is obviously a good thing. It allows people to sustain themselves. So in some ways, then you can say it's a good thing, not spending as much as possible and there should be no limits on how much we spend on shopping. But of course, there is also the other side of shopping as well, which really to me focuses more on how much individual items in our shopping basket actually cost. Um, globalization is a word that gets bounded around an awful lot. And I think that sometimes it's, it's rather clear. But if we take it to mean a process whereby, um, whereby companies are able to use advances in technology to relocate from one jurisdiction to the other, then it means that they are able to take advantage of the benefits of being able to move around. So those companies seeking a competitive advantage, um, as Rick will know very well, I'm sure, will move from one country to another where their costs of production are lowest, so where their labor costs are lowest, where environmental regulation is lowest. And they also take advantage of that. Um, at the same time, of course, countries compete with each other to, um, particularly countries in the global south or developing countries, they compete for the tax revenue that these countries bring and to try and get them to locate within their jurisdictions. So that sparks what we call a race to the bottom. And it means that all the time countries are competing, they're cutting their regulation. And the consequence of this, we see every so often, they bubble to the surface. I'm sure everyone remembers, I think it was about seven or eight years ago now, um, that horror show in Bangladesh where a factory collapsed um, and hundreds of people were killed. There were children working in that factory. And if we bought chocolate anywhere near us, there were children involved in the production of that. Our phones, there were children involved in the production of that too. And it is a function of the race to the bottom that has brought that around. So my argument then um, is that we should be thinking about setting minimum costs on the amount that we spend on our goods. Because if we do that, then obviously it means that that, those, that rising cost will spread through the supply chain and inevitably people right at the very bottom will be paid um, significantly more. Um, so yeah, those are my thoughts. I've got millions more, particularly related to the environment, but um, I don't think we've got enough time for all of that. Thank you. No, it's really helpful scene setting. So, so thank you very much for that, Marcus. And what I'm going to do is, is just follow your thread, actually, and, and put a question back to the other panel members around this concept of um, almost a, a duty to consume. So, so a question for the panel members. Do, do you feel that we do have this positive obligation to be consumers within society? Uh, I'm keen, keen to explore your thoughts around ethical consumption and being an ethical consumer. Uh, and and I'm, I'm drawn very much to uh, Mr. Sunak back in the summer, getting us to spend our way to recovery uh, with, with restaurants and food establishments. Um, so if I cut Ruth first, Ruth, your thoughts. That's a, they're big questions, aren't they? They are. <laughs> um, <laughs> Is, do we have a duty to consume? I guess within a kind of capitalist setup, yes, because that's what maintains that. I guess my questions would be around um, those people that can't afford to consume. Like what happens? Like I think it's really um, important to think about ethical consumption and, you know, uh, propping up the economy or however we want to put it but what happens to those of us who can't afford to do that and um I guess there's some yeah some issues about kind of poverty and disparity and who has disposable income and then even into that I guess there's things about you know rates of interest on credit cards and who uh, certain credit cards and lending companies are marketed to and towards that kind of compound some issues of debt and overspend so yes I think there's a duty perhaps to consume ethically 
but also to think about some of those motivators around what is it that we're trying to do in consumption? Are we trying to, you know, help developing countries improve their economy? Are we trying to fulfill needs within ourselves? Are we trying to, uh, I don't know, there's a multiplicity of reasons we might consume, but um, I guess, yeah, the questions around disparity of kind of those that have income and those that don't and how we can compound debt with this sense of duty co to consume. Thanks, Ruth. Uh, uh, Peter. Uh, <clears throat> just really adding on to, um, on to, to Ruth and to uh, first comment about it, but these being really big questions, they are big questions. Um, I come from a standpoint that we are given talents um, and it probably resonate with Ian and, and a number of you um, in this in, in terms of the money that we earn is part of our the talents talent bank that we've got and I think if there is something that um, certainly the last 12 months has caused me to dwell on is how we spend and utilize those talents to best effect um, and is consumerism and retail the right use of some of those talents that we have in our homes and in our lives? Um, and I just throw that out there. I think another key factor um, is how big corporates are now measured, and they're going to be measured in the, in the future. To date, there has only been one key measure for success of a business, and that's profit. Uh, almost profit. For some, it's been profit at all costs. I think there are now three pillars of success by which businesses will be measured. Profit will be one of them, but there are two others. People, their impact on people, and how we make people feel, and um, in the widest sense of the word, particularly around well-being, but also place. And when I talk about place, I talk about the environment and sustainability. And that will probably play into something that I suspect that Marcus, uh, maybe Rick, will also want to talk about. So I think, in, in short, it's we can repurpose how we use our talents. And I don't think it needs to be in a throwaway retail way that maybe has been coming to the fore over, over recent years, we can use them in, uh, in a more meaningful way going forward. That's it from me. Lovely. Th thank you very much, Peter. Uh, I'll come to Rick next. Thanks, Ben. Um, I guess going back to the first part of the question, uh, capitalism. Um, yeah, we, you know, this... This is the country we live in and, and we live in a capitalist society. So I think sadly, one of the challenges of COVID, which has demonstrated is the downturn in the economy, which for most people, not all, there have been winners in this, as there always are. But generally, on the whole, most people have suffered because of a downturn in the economy. So we do need to spend money and consumerism does need to work. I think it's an interesting point by Peter, what he just made about how you measure a business. Um, being on the business side of the fence here, um, it is about profitability. It is about growth. Um, one of the big things which will have hit most companies throughout this pandemic will have been the budgets and targets that they were set in the last year. They'll have all missed them. Uh, and that puts a lot of pressure on a business. And as soon as the pressure goes onto the business, they start to look at what, where their key costs are. And their key costs are people, are overheads. Now, luckily, Rishi has um, supported most businesses with um, funding to support people. But, as, you know, one of the biggest problems is a lot of businesses fold coming out of a recession. So once that security blanket is removed from companies, you know, sadly, there's going to be a lot of companies that don't make it and they'll disappear. So they're being propped up at the moment by the government. But the consumer element and the spending piece needs to come back to support. And, and it will. Um, I think the measures regarding ethics and purchasing um, you know we are all consumers no matter what you are purchasing and in every category that you buy a product you will be faced with a choice and it's down to you as a consumer to decide 
which product you want to buy. And I would say probably nine out of 10 purchases will be determined by price. As much as we like to say it's other things, it's the ethics, it's sustainability, it's quality. You've always got, unless you are very fortunate in life with my cash perspective, one eye on price. And price will determine where you go in terms of what you purchase, which retailer shop you go into. Do you shop in Waitrose or do you shop in Aldi? And generally speaking, the main reason why you go to one or the other is price. So that for me is one of the key measures in terms of product choice, because a manufacturer of a product or the retailer that then sells it to a consumer, they are all driven by one thing, what the consumer is buying. So ultimately, the power lies with all of us here in terms of every single purchase we make. So this whole consumerism piece, either A, do you buy it or do you not? That's down to you. But then B, what do you buy? And I think more so than ever in most product categories, certainly within my sector of food and drink, you will find products which are better for the environment, better for the people that produce the product, such as coffee. If you look on the back of coffee packs, you will find lots of different badges Rainforest Alliance, fair trade, and it's your choice as to whether you purchase them or not. And many coffees that are still sold on shelf don't have any of those. So it comes down to you at the end of the day in terms of what which products you choose. That's great. Thanks very much, Rick. And Marcus, back to you to sort of round up this this round of debate here. Um, yeah, this sort of, I'm, I'm interested in um, in what Rick and Ruth are saying. Um, and there seems to be sort of a, a general position that um, the consumers have a lot of power in the market. Um, and I'm not necessarily, sh I'm not as on board with that as, um, as Ruth and Rick necessarily. Um, primarily because I often think that consumers don't actually know or are not necessarily in a position to know precisely what the implications of their purchasing are. Um, so I'll give you an example of my, of my thesis. Um, so I was looking at the international diamond trade and there were efforts to try and um, to try and regulate the diamond trade. So you could at one point buy diamonds that have been certified as conflict free, for example. Um, and there were measures in place to try and to try and um, allow that to happen and consumers could know about it and they could buy accordingly. Now, the thing is that you would think to yourself when you buy a, a conflict-free diamond that therefore you are buying ethically. But what we often don't understand and what consumers don't know and don't have the time to know either um, is that there could be unfortunate side effects to all this kind of stuff. So the Kimberley process, which was put in place to try and regulate the diamond trade, um, mandated that countries put in certain safeguards into their diamond production systems. Um, I spent quite a lot of time in Sierra Leone um, studying those. And actually what happened was that those, um, those safeguards were perverted, were manipulated by international companies um, with really quite horrifying results for the local artisanal miners. Um, but the thing is you're buying your diamond and it was certified as conflict free and you knew nothing about that. And it's amazing how often you look at these, um, these sort of certification schemes such as fair trade um, and um, oh God, what was, Rainforest Alliance, there are all sorts of them. Um, and I don't think, I wouldn't think to, to criticize what they do at all, because I think that the general thrust of what they're trying to do is great, but they can have all sorts of really bad side effects. Um, they are in and of themselves actually really very controversial in the research community. Um, and I think it's an awful lot to ask consumers to be able when they make each individual purchase to know which ones of the accreditations actually genuinely work and are good and which ones are not. So I don't think it's actually fair or efficacious to ask consumers to start making those choices. Um, I don't believe in the sort of consumer democracy. I believe in democracy, democracy. I believe in the state stepping in and doing the hard work for us because we don't have the time. We all work 40, 50, 60 hour weeks. We don't have the time to start worrying about everything we see on the shelves. We don't have time to read research papers to see which, which schemes work and which don't. We pay MPs and we pay a vast army of researchers that they rely on to do that for us. So to my mind, we should be telling those people, do the work, step in and regulate so that consumers can buy with confidence, knowing that what they're buying is ethical. Um, so yeah, that's my view on the topic. <laughs> that's great. That thank thank you very much, Marcus. <laughs> What I'll do is um, is just open it up to, to questions from from our members. Um, so we, we've just passed the half hour point. 
So would anybody like to either come back on what anybody said or, or ask a fresh question? So if you, uh, I'll, I'll try and spot hands and uh, you have to forgive my, um, I've got Sue first, I think. Apologies if this is out of turn. So Sue. Um, yeah, just a, a silly one, really. We're talking about choice and we're talking about ethics. Apparently somebody said it's wrong. To there's, um, there's a very easy one that people can make. Is looking at where stuff is made or where it comes mm -hmm. from. I mean, you everything from China is marked made in China. Mm -hmm. But if you say, no, I'm not buying it, thinking of the ergas just for one, mm -hmm. then if that product doesn't sell and enough people don't buy it, then it's not worth people in this country buying it, importing it, if it's not going to sell. So you mm -hmm. can have a drastic effect if there's a specific aim that you want to, you know, some yeah. target that you want to do. Yeah. And so if you look at things, even the mugs that you buy in the range or in Safeways or wherever, That's their living. if you look and it says made in China, you put it back and you keep asking for something mm -hmm. made in England or made somewhere else, made in the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. yeah. We can have a choice and we can affect how the shops that we shop in buy and how they source their material so okay. that's my opinion that's uh, i throw it open yeah, yeah. thanks I, very much sue um mm -hmm. so if if i could put that put that out to the panel then uh, so perhaps peter first I, I think that you make a very strong and compelling point sue um the the one um Point that we also probably need to factor in is that people buy a lot of things online mm -hmm. um, and where uh, products are manufactured aren't always clear when you buy a product online um, certainly if you, if you went to buy something off um, Amazon would it become very apparent um, where something was manufactured before you bought it I doubt it um, obviously, when you get it, when it arrives, you may look at it and look, look at the packaging and think, well, no, um, not going to have that. I'm going to send it back. But um, you then may think, well, actually, that's too much hassle. I'll, I'll just live with it. And so it works if you if you can go into a shop and see and do the touch and feel and read the label. Mm. Um, shopping online still poses challenges in, in terms of that ethical decision, I think. Thanks, Peter. Ruth, could you help us, do you think, with the humanitarian aspect of this? Because I think that's a really impactive part that Sue's identified. Yeah, it's a tricky one, isn't it? I guess I would want to kind of take a little bit of a step back and look at what are the reasons we buy things? Like, why, why do we buy those things? And I guess if without looking at the humanitarian thing I guess I want to kind of come back to what Marcus was saying about choice and I don't think I'm disagreeing with him really I think that um I don't really I'm not really an informed consumer at all because there's so many layers of things that I'm not privy to but I also think there's this level of kind of coercion like are we ever really making a choice when you know you have advertising and there's quite a lot I think of social pressure around what we choose to buy so why are we buying cheap products made in China what what is the drive for that where has that come from what within us is saying I need that product I need to buy that thing and I think that that's a really interesting question when we think about the kind of pandemic stuff and the things that we've had to kind of um, lay aside and not have and not touch and not look at in shops like what are those things do we not actually need and and what are the reasons that we're kind of driven to purchase certain items which you know can be made ethically or could be you know have massive implications in terms of humanitarian kind of um situations around the world and kind of disparity and poverty and stuff great thank you very much i think i've got a question from the other ruth 
Yes, well, I, I think probably one of the reasons, and maybe the biggest reason why uh, you know, we, we buy these things, it's not so much need, because most of us, we have enough mugs. I looked in my cupboard, I have 32. <laughs> so I think we do it because we don't know what to do with ourselves. And even before we were locked down and we had jobs to go to, we did not know what to do with ourselves. If, if you go into any shopping mall, even nowadays, you can still see people wandering around disconsolately, you know, um, like you know going through these cheap shops maybe waiting for other shops to reopen and and it's like you know they need to get out of the house then they need some justification for why they ended up in the shopping center in in the first place i mean i actually have an anti-shopping list in, in in my house all the things that i think i would never need to buy again no matter how long i live and if you know, to, to make sure that you know, I, I stop doing it but i i think you know most of it, it it's not really run by need it's it's this desire uh, you know to think well you know they might stop making it tomorrow they probably won't you, I mean, you, you know, and even if they did, you know, probably our shops and warehouses, you know, you know they have enough things and to keep us going for centuries. <laughs> and, yes, you know, I mean, I, I really do think, you know, we, we need to uh, examine, you know, like, you know, what else are we going to do with our lives? I, I love your idea about the anti-shopping list. That's something I must introduce to my family. So um, thank you very much for that. So, so. Rick, Marcus, thought, thought your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, listen, it, it's it's hard to disagree. And, and jumping back to Marcus's point regarding, you know, government intervention, you know, I wholeheartedly agree with that, that they need to help us and steer us. Um, if you think about going to do one food shop, how many items you pop in your basket, there's no way you can read and understand all of those products. I think... Um, Another piece just to introduce to it um, is also the education piece in terms of helping our kids. Um, I've got two young children. They're going through schools at the moment, uh, infant and primary level. And the amount of knowledge and information that's downloaded to them about environmental social impact versus when I was a kid um, is dramatically different. So I think hopefully the next wave, the next generation coming through are going to be more aware, which, which puts them one step ahead uh, in terms of trying to solve this problem because it is difficult when you sit and watch a David Attenborough program, you get to the end of it and, you know, your heart sinks as much as he's trying to be positive at the end when he's saying we can turn this around. I do have a bit of a mm, human beings don't tend to really listen to these sort of things. We really push it until it's too late. So I, I don't know that the government, I mean, one of, one of the, the big interventions recently that the government did from a consumer perspective, weirdly, which affected our purchasing decisions was the simple tax on a plastic bag. Mm, plastic yeah. bag consumption went down by about 85%. Yeah. And, and that was what, 5p to begin with, I think it is. And I think it still is now. I don't know because I've not bought a plastic bag for a long time. Um, so it goes to show that, you know, that there are ways, but it needs to be a blend. There needs to be a bit of government. There needs to be a bit of retailer because... In my world, the retailers hold a lot of power. The likes of Tesco's, you know, sorry to say it, but when you see a lot of products on offer in a Tesco's, mm. when they do that price reduction, it's the supplier that pays for that price reduction, not the supermarket. Mm. And often in many categories and for many suppliers, they will lose money when they promote. So what they're relying on is when they're not discounted, that you still buy that product at full price. Because if you don't, that company doesn't make any money. So, you know, the, the retailers themselves have got to step up to the mantle and try and st help steer us along the pass. And they are doing that. Um, Tesco's, for example, at the moment in the drinks category, won't accept any new products from manufacturers that are in PET, virgin PET, which is plastic bottles. So, you know, they are making inroads, um, but it's not happening overnight. It takes a long time, sadly, and I say the word sadly because I wish it was quicker, to turn these ships around because manufacturers are built on machines which have cost millions of pounds and the throughput of these machines. So it's, you know, it's, it is turning, the tide is turning, but it takes time, sadly. Thanks, Rick. And I've got a question from Julia. We're just on mute, Julia. I just wondered how many of the panel um, shop routinely in secondhand shops, charity yeah. shops, and what, what effect do they think it has on the economy? I know that. 
So I, I'll I say we yeah. lost you a little bit there, Julian. I, I think it was a shop. A question was: How many of the panel shop in um, secondhand shops? I'm in there all the time looking for books for my kids um, and, and things to keep them amused. You know, they're, they're big readers. So, and um, whether we like it or not, the high street is full of charity shops. So you, you get more choice in charity shops than anywhere else now. Thanks, Rick. Uh, Peter? Yeah, I'm not a, um, not a shop in, in the charity shops, but we also, as a family, we donate to the charity shops as well. Um, so I'm often sent off to... Uh, with bags and bags of um, my wives and daughters' clothes to uh, the charity shops and the old toys that they had when they were kids. And, and Marcus, if I come to you, the um, charity shops seem, seem to be taking over many town centres, which is a, a, quite a, a change in, in shopping behaviour. So your thoughts? Yeah, they don't pay business rates, do they? So um, they're, they're, they're quite an attractive thing for... Uh, for um, for uh, shop owners, I think. Um, though shamefully, um, I do not shop at uh, second-hand shops. Um, so yeah, you called me, um, and I should do. I know that I should. I can say in my defence that um, I don't really do a lot of shopping full stop, as my wife often points out to me. I own two pairs of shoes, which pair of boots for the winter, pair of flip flops for the summer. So my consumption of stuff it tends to be pretty low. Um, however, when I buy clothes and figure, I do tend to buy new. My books are all second-hand. Um, particularly academic books, cost an absolute fortune. There's no other way of doing it. Um, but yeah, that's that's about the sum of it, I'm afraid. Um, I had a couple of thoughts on some of the things that have sort of got before. Um, and Sue, I was interested in your comment of knowing where we buy things, um, knowing where they come from, um, which is something that's always interested me. Um, and that's one of the sort of the thing I was alluding to when I was talking about globalization and how production has changed, particularly over the last three or four decades. Um, my phone, for example, you know, what's left of it anyway, um, is this was put together in a factory in Foxconn, which is um, in eastern uh, China. Uh, the factory itself is horrible. It has the highest suicide rates per square foot of anywhere on earth. Um, but all they do is assemble it there. All the other stuff comes from all over the world, um, particularly the component parts of it. The cobalt, the thing that actually means that I can receive phone calls from it, that comes from the Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo. Mm. Um, the actual casing itself, I understand, is built in South Korea. So, and this is the same with everything. Our cars, they are actually put together in one place, and then they are stamped as being made in China, or being made in Czech Republic or whatever. But actually, they come from all over the world, and it's really hard to know exactly what the implications of that are um, if you want to try and buy ethically. Um, Rick, I was really interested though in what you what you had to say about the environmental impact um, of of consumerism and about how depressing sometimes it can be, particularly when you watch um, David Attenborough and, and people like that. And I used to find actually, particularly when I taught courses at university, that my courses were um, often incredibly depressing. Um, if you were to, if you were to sit through them, not just with my delivery, but actually the content um, was really quite depressing. Um, because when you think about it, if you look at the graphs, um, if you plot the growth in global GDP um, alongside growth in CO2 emissions, then they track each other almost perfectly as they go up. They're really, really stubborn things to decouple, um, and we've actually not succeeded really in doing that. Um, so, I mean, all the efforts that we are going to right now when it comes to wind power, electric vehicles, and all that kind of stuff. I think it's possible that, you know, we could maybe, so GDP will continue to go up, and maybe we could get um, CO2 emissions to, to tail off a little bit and to plateau. But at the end of the day, all of um, our economy is based on um, consumption. And so sooner or later, we're going to need more wind turbines, we're going to need more cars, more electric cars and we will still end up consuming more and more. So all we are really doing is creating space for ourselves. At some point in the future, um, and I think it may have to come sooner rather than later, I think we've all got to start thinking about alternative ways of living that are not necessarily based around consumption. So when Ruth talks about how it is that people go out and buy and they don't really think about it, she's absolutely correct. People do go and do that and we do it far too much. And in my view, I think sooner or later, everyone is going to have to rethink why it is we go out and buy. Do we really need it? Um, yeah, those are my thoughts. Thanks, Marcus. 
And and finally, Ruth, charity shops, yes or no? Um, yeah, yes. yeah, big thumbs up for me. Yeah, with lots of charity shop shopping in our house, lots of kind of buying locally recycled stuff. But interestingly, um, my kids are very happy with having kind of charity shop Christmas presents. They've always been happy with that. But some of their friends at school, that just that's a new experience for them that um, everything has to be branded and new. And so I think there is some, there are some, kind of questions about um, what we think is valuable, what the kind of labels we put on stuff and, and the way that um, people perceive what we purchase and the way we want to be perceived by people around what we purchase. So I think as a middle class person, I'm quite happy charity shop shopping, but some of the people that I've worked alongside who maybe come from a different economic kind of um, background actually see charity sh shopping as something almost shameful. So I think there is something that we have to kind of pull apart about, you know, kind of the second hand thing and, and used goods and all of that. Lovely, thank you very much. Uh, and I've now got uh, Paul from Ruth and Paul. Thanks. Question. Uh, they used to say in the 1980s and probably into the 1990s, you could always tell how well a town centre was doing by the amount of charity shops that were there, which meant that all the little shops were closing down and charity shops were opening, opening up to replace them. So the town centres are actually going down. Yeah, definitely, definitely a, a current feature of, of what we experience. Did you have a, a, a question for the panel, Paul, in relation to that specifically? No, no, I just, I just wanted to, to say that. But while, you, while yeah. I'm about to talk, I'll be very quick. The one downside I've got with Amazon mm. is that you can buy a small article mm. and you end up getting it in a gigantic mm -hmm. box mm. with masses of paper surrounding it, which isn't necessary and it's just completely wasteful. Mm. So, no, thank, thank you, Paul. And amazingly, we haven't got on to internet shopping yet. So I think that's a, a great segue to perhaps the final part of, of, of today's talk. So, so uh, Rick, I've got you in my sights at the moment. So thoughts around Amazon and the the digital marketplace? Yeah, um, I guess, oddly, I don't actually shop online um, at all. Um, it's rare for me to purchase. Um, but, you know, this pandemic has probably accelerated the death of the high street by several years, um, unfortunately, especially for the sole trader. Um, lots of smaller businesses have very, very quickly tried to get online. Some have been successful, others has, have not. Their product doesn't really transpire to the online environment. Um, and again, whether we like it, most people quite enjoy sitting on their sofa um, and just pressing a button. You know, I guess even when you look at food with Deliveroo and Just Eat and their phenomenal growth over the last 12 months, you know, it's, it's scary how now we all just want takeaway food brought to our door. We, we, don't, we can't even be bothered going to go and get it anymore mm. um, if you can, if you are able to go and get it. So I think, look, the, the Internet is around. There's many, many advantages of the Internet and shopping. It, it helps many, many people. But equally, what it does is, you know, it makes it a lot cheaper for those people that are the internet retailers to sell a product. Ultimately, they, they work off bigger margins. It's that simple. They haven't got bricks and mortar like the high street does. So they can't compete. It's that simple. So for a lot of people, this then comes back to the consumer and say, here's your choice. You know, you can probably go and buy that same product in a shop if you choose to. And most people are just going click. No, I don't want to. Thanks. And, and Ruth, we know from your poem that you, you may be tempted online. Yeah, very definitely. But also, um, I'm quite tempted by Etsy, which I think is quite a positive thing. So I think I've spent a lot more on kind of independent, like local blossoming businesses, quite a lot more on, on shops owned by women, which I think for me is really important. So quite a lot of kind of artsy businesses, jewellery makers, people who maybe wouldn't get the exposure on a high street or couldn't afford kind of building, um, you know, rental stuff. So I think there are some real advantages in that kind of very little internet 
kind of business stuff that you can kind of choose to buy almost anti Amazon, although mine is kind of blended. There is some Amazon buying because financially we need certain things and that's, you know, we make a pragmatic decision, probably very unethically. Um, but I try and balance some of that with like locally handmade, you know, goods as well. Super. Th thanks, Ruth. And Peter? Um, yeah, I think the, the digital economy is clearly here to here to stay. There's, there's an interesting paper out there um, by an organisation called the Board of Innovation about the low-touch economy. Um, it will certainly have an impact, and we're already seeing it, on the high street. Um, I'm a very much a glass half full person rather than half empty. So I think that the high street can change and will have to change. And it may well be that the large retail units that we see in the high street actually will then be broken up and repurposed. And you could see quite easily that in terms of that repurposing, creating opportunities for smaller independent businesses locally to have a footprint on the high street and to create a very different high street experience the one that we've experienced um, during the past few decades so i can see that as being a, uh, a force for good thanks thanks peter and and marcus um yeah i, I don't really know how i feel about online um generally speaking i think it's probably not a good thing and I you know as a Bobby working in Bournemouth Town Centre for a long time um, well not that long but a couple of years I've just seen shops shut and it kind of rips the heart out of the community really and people aren't yet stepping into that gap that doesn't mean of course that they won't um, and I'm, I hope that they will and the independent shops will open um, I think what worries me about a lot of the online stuff is that lots of the companies that do it are big um, you know Amazon, um, Google, eBay, all this lot. They're enormous companies. Um, they have huge amounts of, of market power and they are just not paying tax. Um, they use very clever like accounting methods, frankly not very clever actually, to just bounce profits between territories so that they don't have to pay tax. Um, so they take advantage of all the infrastructure of this country. They take advantage of the roads, the telecommunications networks. They take advantage of a healthy workforce, courtesy of the NHS, an educated workforce of our school system but they don't contribute to it um, and I feel that that is innately wrong um, and I think one way or another we have to tie these people down. Um, I don't know how exactly we go about doing that but that is my theory about, um, yeah, about the online stuff actually. So in general I'm not, I'm not actually that keen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We're, we're approaching the last five minutes of our discussion friends. So what I'll do is just invite each of the panel members for one final thought to, for you to all go away with uh, and to leave in your minds. So if I come first to Rick, please. Right, I've got a poem. No, I <laughs> <laughs> um, I, listen, I know Marcus mentioned a point about government intervention and helping us with our purchase, and I totally agree with that. Um, but I think that there is a balance. I think my final thought is literally we're all consumers and we do have a lot of power. Um, I've sat in front of Tesco's many times, Sainsbury's, Asda, you name it. And they always hit me if they're going to say no to me with your, the consumers aren't buying your products. I'm sorry, it's going to go. So, you know, you do have the power. You do have the choice. I, I fully appreciate you have to balance that off with your own economic situation, um, your locality, et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately... You do have a lot of choice and you do have a lot of power out there. So wield your sword wisely. Wise words. Thank you, Rick. And and Ruth, thank you again for your poem, but your final thoughts. Yeah, I don't have any more poems. Um, I think <laughs> I, I would like to take away something, which is Ruth's thought about anti-shopping list. I feel really challenged by that, actually. And and to be quite reflective myself about what do I need and what do what do I not need. So, you know, I think that's a challenge to myself to think about what drives my consumption and what can I kind of leave behind and not 
and not have to take with me. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And Marcus. Sorry, I keep forgetting on mute. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose that what I take away from this is it's nice to hear so many people say that they don't really believe necessarily in consumption. Um, and I think it's important. It, it's nice to hear it and it's nice to see that everyone is starting to realise the impact of, of their consumption um, on the environment in particular. Um, I just, what worries me is that if, if we leave it to the market to, i.e., you know, demand, supply and demand, um, or demand and supply, you know, consumers going out and buying ethically and behaving ethically, I really worry about that um, because, call me a cynic, but I just don't have that much faith in, in that many people. I, I'm just worried that people are, are perhaps intellectually lazy or they just don't care um, for various reasons. And even though like for the last 20 or 30 years, particularly in the US and the UK, you know, government regulation has been rolled back and there's been a, been a big push to get rid of government regulation. I think it, that kind of thing needs to come back in. Frankly, if we're going to survive as a species, um, it's a little bit depressing, but I really think that that's, that's, where we're, that's where we've arrived at with consumption. Super, thank you, Marcus. And Peter? Uh, so I've got, I've got two thoughts. Um, one is, springs off um, Ruth's um, anti-shopping list. I'm intrigued as to whether her list is longer than Paul's or the other way around. Um, but more seriously, um, people reflecting on um, what means more buying stuff or experiences, which gives um, more pleasure in the, in the long run, using talents to their best advantage and living life with integrity, always doing the right thing, even when nobody else is looking and applying that to shopping, I think, um, can um, set us on, a, on, the right, uh, on the right track. And do remember Martin Luther King, who started, I have a dream, and he's mm. only one person. So you can make a difference. That's a great, great point to close on. Thank, thank you very much, Peter. Well, thank, thank you, everybody who's taken part today. Um, I think we've achieved our objective, and that, that was to create this space for ethical debate, uh, to tackle those difficult things in society, which we've done. So I think for all of us, the next time we press click to buy or do that contactless payment, it'll make us think one little degree further than we've achieved something. So thank you very much. Um, and Ian, do we need to introduce the topic for next week? I think we're there actually, Ben, um, because the topic for next week is a natural kind of progression. It flows on. It's does the economy decide everything? So it's coming. It's an issue that's been touched on quite a bit today. And for me, this flows out of what, what you were saying, Peter, just now about having a dream for what it is to be human and for what it is to be human society. Does the economy decide everything? Well, I'm a parish priest for most of my life and I'm an educationalist. No way does the economy decide everything. But for more on this, come back next week at three o'clock and we have a very exciting panel. So today I'll add my thanks to you for chairing Ben and to Ruth, Marcus, Rick and Peter for a really excellent session of these ethics forums. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.